welcome to Paulsbury Community Church. My name is Stephen, one of the leaders here. Hey, we're so excited to be with you today. Uh, Psalm 100 says, let's praise the Lord with joy. With, like, let's stand today. Let's, let's use our bodies to sing God's praises joyfully to remind ourselves that we have a reason to sing. So can you join us? Let's come into the presence of Jesus with joy this morning. Let's sing his praises. Let's raise our voices and make the gospel true. Will you join us? Here we go. Ready? One, two. One, two, three, huh? And I was an orphan lost at the fall Running away when I heard you call Father, you worked your will I had no righteousness of my own I had no right to draw near your throne Father, you love me still And in love, and in love Before you laid the world's foundation You predestined to adopt me as your own You have raised me up so I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone. Let's celebrate Him together, we say. You left your home. You left your home to seek out the lost. You knew the great and terrible cause Jesus, your face was set I worked my fingers down to the bone Nothing I did could ever atone Jesus, you paid my debt By your blood, by your blood I have redemption and salvation Lord, you died that I might reap what you have sown. And you rose, and you rose that I might be a new creation. I am born again by grace and grace alone. I was in darkness. I was in darkness all of my life. I never knew the day from the night. You made me see. I swear I knew the way on my own. Devil of rocks, a heart made of stone. Spirit, you moved in me. At your touch, my sleeping spirit was awakened. At my darkened heart, the light of Christ has shone, called into a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Heaven said is in by grace and grace alone. So I stand in faith by grace and grace alone. I will run the race by grace and grace. celebrate Jesus together. Let's sing another song.
religion The sun comes up It's a new day dawning It's time to sing your song again Whatever may pass And whatever lies before me Let me be singing when the evening comes Bless the Lord Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. this morning. God, thank you for your goodness. God, we praise you for the way that you served the church. God, you saved us by your blood on the cross. This morning, Jesus, we receive it in faith, thanking you. God, you're worthy of all praise. Who else will we praise? Thank you, Jesus. God, make us one like you are one. Help us to love one another. In your name, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Can we celebrate Jesus this morning? Thank you guys for singing with us. It's so great to be the church. And you can have a seat at this time. We're going to transition into a time of announcements and updates. Uh, So hang tight. We'll come right back. Good morning. Welcome, guys. We are so glad.
that you guys are here with us this morning. My name is Elle, and this is Abby. And yesterday, we did something super fun. Yesterday was the Jonah Maze, the highly anticipated. We had a blast. Kids walked out with so much candy. I heard one kid even say, when asked if he wanted more candy, no thank you, my bag is too heavy already. <laughs> which I don't think I've ever heard a child say that before. So that was pretty exciting. Um, but it was so much fun. And I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you guys who helped make that happen. And also thank you to those who came. And I hope that you had so much fun. It was a blast. And the kids were so cute. But the Jonah excitement does not end there. Um, <clears throat> this morning, actually, we are launching our Jonah Take Two, which is really exciting here um, in the sermon. And that means that we are going to be launching our DNA groups this week. And if you haven't heard about what DNA groups are, basically, they are micro groups where you get to grab a friend or two and go through Jonah uh, again. We're going to do it um, here on Sunday mornings, and we're going to do it throughout the week with our workbook, Jonah Take Two, which is going to be really cool because you thought you saw a lot in Jonah during the first round through, um, you're going to see even more about God, about us, about Jonah, about the Ninevites. It's going to be a really amazing experience getting to go through it again. If you would like help getting connected to a DNA group, please, um, if you're a guy, email Pastor Gordy at gordy at paulsbocc.com and he'll get you connected. If you are a lady, Miss um, Colleen will get you connected and her email is colleen at paulsbocc.com. Um, if you want to invite a friend who maybe is not a part of Paulsbrook Community Church, maybe they're a family member, maybe they go to another church, or maybe they don't go to church at all, and they need a Jonah book, we have plenty of extras. Please stop by the kiosk on your way out. Go ahead and grab one. We'd love to put one in your hands for that friend. Um, if you're joining us online this morning and you would like to get one of those Jonah books, please let us know. Um, you can email either Colleen or Pastor Gordy, or you can email... Um, just the church at office at paulsbocc.com, and we will mail one of those to you. So please let us know. We'd love to have you join us um, in Jonah Take Two. Very exciting. Okay, if yes. you are in the building this morning, um, there is a couple of things on your seats. There's an outline. Go ahead and grab that because we're going to get started with the sermon here in just a second. There's also a connect card on your seats. Go ahead and fill those out. And there's a basket in the back of the room labeled giving envelopes. Go ahead and toss that connect card in that basket when you walk out this morning. Um, if you're joining us online today, um, go ahead and check out the description box below. There are tons of good links down there. There's a link to our outline. Go ahead and download that. Um, and there's also a link to our connect card. Go ahead and fill that out on there. That is a great way to be connected with us if you're online this morning. There's also a link to our giving page where you can send in your tithe um, digitally um, on our website. So go ahead and take a few minutes to just check those links out down there. And we're going to get started with the message. Earlier this year, a Twitter account for a local sheriff's office started receiving attention from around the nation after it issued a confusing tweet. The first sentence from the San Miguel Sheriff's Office read, Large boulder, the size of a small boulder, is completely blocking eastbound lane highway 145 at Silver Pick Road. Please use caution and watch for emergency vehicles in the area. Well, almost immediately, Twitter users started to question whether there was an exception in the law of physics and space-time that would somehow explain how a large boulder could be the size of a small boulder. Asked one user, 
What's heavier? A large boulder the size of a small boulder or a small boulder the size of a large one? A different user wondered if perhaps the boulder was having self-esteem issues. It felt like a small boulder in the body of a large boulder, or, or is it a large boulder in a small boulder's body? Still, yet another user, a you know, tweeter, offered a potential fashion solution. Perhaps the large boulder was wearing Spanx or similar compression garment. That would explain how a large boulder could fit into the size of a small boulder. Well, after providing an update that the boulder had been removed, the sheriff's office offered a clarification in order to clear up any outstanding confusion. Quote, the boulder that fell onto Highway 145 at Silver Pick Road was approximately four feet by four feet by four feet, 64 cubic feet, and weighed about 10,000 pounds. Well, there you go. Good morning, church. Welcome, everyone. My name is Lincoln. I'm the lead pastor of Paul's Boat Community Church, and I'm hoping we've cleared up any outstanding confusion about the book of Jonah in the first five weeks of our all-church Jonah study. Jonah, the runaway prophet. Using our Bibles and this workbook, we have been studying Jonah, the serving the contents of this classic Old Testament book and discovering what the book of Jonah is and is not about. I say classic Old Testament book because a lot of people know about the story of Jonah, but not as many people actually know the story of Jonah. And knowing what Jonah is really about and what Jonah is not about. But now that you've all read through the book of Jonah, you've spent five weeks breaking out the text, so perhaps you know and appreciate some things about this book that you did not know or appreciate five weeks ago. On your study handout that's been provided for you under the heading Jonah, the runaway prophet, now you know for sure that the book of Jonah is not about a whale. Was the great fish that swallowed Jonah a whale? Uh, Probably, the text talks about a great fish. The Hebrew word can mean any aquatic animal. It was probably a whale. Perhaps it was a great fish the size of a small fish. No, let's not even go there. Uh, The point is, when people think of Jonah, they think Jonah and the whale. But the great fish is only mentioned in three of the 49 verses in the book. The whale is only 6% of Jonah's story. And the book of Jonah is about so much more than Jonah being swallowed by a great fish. Warning. Focus on the whale, get distracted by the whale, and wow, you will miss the biggest and most important messages in the book of Jonah. What the book of Jonah is not about. The book of Jonah on your handout is not about how everyone deserves a second chance. Many teachers and writers suggest that the main point of the book of Jonah is about how we all blow it, we all make mistakes, we all sin, and that is true. And God understands that, and hey, everybody deserves a second chance. Like Jonah got a second chance to obey God and do what God asked of him. Like the pagan mariners in Jonah chapter 1 got a second chance. Like the evil Ninevites in Jonah chapter 3 got a second chance. But in fact, the Bible is clear that no one deserves a second chance. Not Jonah, not the mariners, not the Ninevites, not even even us. As soon as we say a person deserves a second chance, we move into the realm of salvation by our own merit works righteousness, that God is is obligated to show us mercy and grace. And that is not a lesson in the book of Jonah. One of the big lessons of the text, that God is not obligated to show us mercy and grace to a rebellious humanity. The Bible explains that rebellion, human rebellion, deserves punishment, that God's wrath for human sin demands justice. Somebody has to pay the price. But God's character is such that he is also merciful. He is slow to anger. He's abounding in steadfast love. He is 
not wanting anyone to perish, says the book of Jonah. And so God shows mercy to whom he will show mercy, not because anyone deserves it, but because God is merciful. There's a story told about a mother who came to Napoleon on behalf of her son who was scheduled to be executed. The mother asked the emperor to issue a pardon, but Napoleon pointed out that this was the man's second offense and justice demanded his death. I don't ask for justice, the mother replied. I plead for mercy. Well, the emperor objected. He said, your son doesn't deserve mercy. Sir, it would not be mercy if he deserved it, and mercy is all I ask. Well, her son was granted that pardon. When God is merciful to us, it's not because we deserve it. It's because God is gracious. It's because Jesus, God's own son, bears God's wrath. Jesus bears our punishment for our sin in our place. And to say that we somehow deserve God's mercy is to suggest that we can earn it. And that's to deny the very nature of God's grace. The book of Jonah is certainly not about how everyone deserves a second chance. The book of Jonah, it's not about whales. It's not about second chances. In fact, the book of Jonah is not even about Jonah. We've observed in our study of Jonah that Jonah was more concerned about Jonah and less concerned about others. Remember in Jonah chapter 4 how Jonah was distressed to the extreme over the destruction of his leafy plant, a plant which shaded Jonah from the heat of the sun. And Jonah was indifferent to, even in favor of God destroying the citizens of Nineveh. But not everything's about you, Jonah. The Lord's gentle and clear indictment of Jonah at the end of the book is that Jonah should care less about himself and have more compassion for the people in need around him. Jonah's story is one of self-pity. Self-pity, but seemingly no pity for the lost and hurting people around him. Eugene Peterson. Eugene Peterson wrote, The attractiveness of pity and the ugliness of self-pity are unarguable. Yet we live in a society in which self-pity far exceeds pity. Billy Graham preached, the smallest package I ever saw was a man wrapped up wholly in himself. The Bible teaches this, in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. That's a lesson the Lord was teaching Jonah, is teaching us. The book of Jonah is ultimately not about Jonah. If the book of Jonah is not about a whale, if it's not about deserving a second chance, if it's not even about Jonah, then what is it about? And here's how I recommend we approach our second pass through the book of Jonah. On your handout, we're calling it the book of Jonah, take two. As we are working through the book of Jonah these next five weeks, I want us to read the text each day and then take a step back asking the following questions. This is something that I do to prepare for our Sunday studies. I read the text and then I ask the question, what does this book say about God? What does the text say about God? What does the chapter, the passage before me, say about the divine being? What does the book of Jonah say about who God is? About what God does? About how God interacts with all that he's made? And about God's relationship with his people? The book of Jonah has a lot to say about God. Look at Jonah 1.1, how it starts out. Now, The word of the Lord came to Jonah. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. What does that sentence say about God? Well, he's a God who speaks to us. He reveals himself to the people he's made. 
God, the creator of all that exists, he wants to be known. He wants to be known by me. The Lord has things to say to us, and he says them so that we can understand him. Things we need to hear, things we need to respond to. The book of Jonah has a lot to say about who God is. The book of Jonah, take two. Read the text, and this time ask yourself, what does the book of Jonah say about us? What I mean by that is, what does the book of Jonah say about human nature? Because when you read this book, you will bump into human rebellion and fear and hope and repentance, faith, idolatry, spiritual awareness, and spiritual ignorance. You've got Jonah. You've got the sailors. You've got the Ninevites along with their king. The book of Jonah is a fascinating case study of human behavior and attitudes. So in your own take two of Jonah's book, I want you to think Clint Eastwood and look for what this book is saying about human nature. The good, the bad, and what? The ugly. And there's some ugly about us in the book of Jonah and why we need the Lord to save us. In fact, that's the next question. What does the book of Jonah say about salvation? There is a lot of what theologians call soteriology in the book of Jonah. Perhaps the key verse of the entire book is Jonah 2.9. Salvation belongs to the Lord. What does that statement mean? Salvation belongs to the Lord. How do we see that truth realized in the book of Jonah? Jonah, the sailors on the ship, the citizens of Nineveh, there is a sense in which God comes to the rescue of all of them. In the book of Jonah, what does salvation look like? Salvation from what? Salvation to what? And if salvation does belong to the Lord, does that imply that salvation doesn't belong to others? That the Lord is the exclusive source of human salvation. It's fascinating. And more than fascinating, our eternal lives hang on the answers to these questions. I know if we look closely, we will bump into Jesus and the gospel message in the book of Jonah because Jesus himself saw himself and his saving work in the story of Jonah. Jonah, take two. The fourth question I'll ask is, what does the book say about the message and mission of the church? The book of Jonah is a missional book, meaning that we can read and study the book of Jonah and recognize the call of God on his people, his will for those persons who make up the people of God. God commissions Jonah to take his message to Nineveh. It's it's a message of divine judgment for human sin, a message that will open the way to repentance and faith to receiving God's mercy and grace. And like God commissioned Jonah to take his message to the lost people of Nineveh, Jesus commissions his followers to take his message, the gospel message, to lost people in our world because it's the power of God for the salvation of those who believe. God has a call on our lives to obey his will. And God has a call on our hearts to feel and show compassion for people in need. Jonah seems to finally get the doing what God says right. You know, the second part of the book, Jonah takes God's message to Nineveh. He gets obedience right. But we don't know if Jonah ever gets the compassion piece right. I like to think that eventually Jonah does get it right. I like to think, I believe that Jonah himself retells this part of the story so that we can learn from Jonah's failings. Learning from Jonah, we keep asking the question, what does the book of Jonah say about the message and the mission of the church? 
Well, that's how we're going to approach the book, the second pass through. Let's go ahead and look at the whole book again. We're going to survey the entire book of Jonah, getting us ready for this week's study of the whole book, breaking out the book of Jonah. We survey the whole book of Jonah, seeing how its different pieces hold together before we can break out each chapter individually. So much of good Bible study is having an awareness of the greater context. In grad school, I had this truth about Bible study drilled into me by my Old Testament and New Testament professors. Write it down somewhere on your handout. Context is everything. Context is everything. C-I-E. Most of the questions you have about what you're reading in the Bible, about the meaning of what the Bible says in a particular verse, those questions are often answered right there in the greater context of the passage and the book. What does Jonah 2.9 mean? Salvation belongs to the Lord. Well, to answer that question, you need to know the greater context of the verse, which is all of Jonah chapter 2, and and then the greater book of Jonah, and expanding out from there the context of both the Old and New Testaments. For right now, we will stick to the context of the book of Jonah. After five weeks of studying Jonah, and with the help of our workbooks, we're seeing patterns in the book and making certain connections. So let's do that. With your handout and a Bible, we're breaking out all of the book of Jonah. I want you to see that the book of Jonah includes two acts, like two acts in a play, and then a final climax. And those two acts have lots of connections with one another. Act one, on your handout, God calls Jonah, and Jonah flees for Tarshish. We've read it together several times now. We're going to do it again. Would you find in your Bible Jonah 1, verses 1 through 3? Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. To go with them. That's the pagan sailors on board the ship. Pagan meaning that they did not worship the Lord. They worshiped other gods. So on your handout... Jonah and the pagan sailors. God sends a storm to rock their world. The storm threatens to destroy them all. Jonah explains that the Lord has brought about this storm in response to Jonah's disobedience. Now bounce your eyes down to verse 11, Jonah 1, 11. Then they, the pagan sailors, said to Jonah, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. Jonah said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. That's how Jonah ended up in the sea where the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. In Jonah 2, Jonah is inside the great fish, and he's offering up a prayer of thanks. On your handout, Jonah's grateful prayer. See how Jonah starts his prayer. Jonah 2.2. Jonah 2.2. I called out to the Lord... Out of my distress, and the Lord answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, and you heard my voice. The belly of Sheol. Just write a note in your text. That's not the belly of the whale. That's the belly of certain death. 
When Jonah was drowning, the Lord sent a whale to swallow Jonah. I called out to the Lord, and he answered me. Drop your eyes down to verse 9. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. That's the end of Jonah's grateful prayer. But keep reading. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah upon the dry land. Jonah 3.1 Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. On your handout, this is Act 2. God calls Jonah and Jonah goes to Nineveh. And then the focus of Jonah chapter 3 is Jonah and the pagan, this time it's the pagan, Ninevites. Like the pagan sailors in the storm on the sea, they didn't want to perish. Now it's the pagan Ninevites in the city of Nineveh. They don't want to perish. They turn from their sin and they turn to God. So Jonah chapter 3 ends this way. Look at verse 10. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. You see the connections? Like the sailors were saved from the storm of God's wrath in Act 1, the Ninevites are now saved from the storm of God's wrath in Act 2. And we'd like to say that what followed after the Ninevites were saved from destruction was another grateful prayer from Jonah. But in Act 2, Jonah's prayer is a what? It's a what? It's, it's an angry prayer. Now we get Jonah's angry prayer. Jonah 4.1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly that God didn't destroy Nineveh. And Jonah was angry. And he prayed to the Lord. And the prayer that follows is Jonah's angry prayer. It's a prayer that ends with Jonah's death wish. Oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. I can't live in a world where Ninevites are shown God's grace. Jonah's angry prayer. That's the end of Act Two. And so, do you see the pattern in the book? First, God calls Jonah, and Jonah flees for Tarshish. That tracks with God's second call in the second act, but now Jonah obeys and he goes to Nineveh. Jonah and the pagan sailors in Jonah chapter 1, that parallels Jonah and the pagan Ninevites in Jonah 3. Same with the prayers. In act 1, Jonah's thankful prayer, but in act 2, it's Jonah praying again, Unfortunately, it's with an alarming twist. It's Jonah's angry prayer. Do you see it? Do you see it? How the structure of the book, it is set us, setting us up for this all-important climax of Jonah chapter 4, 5 through 11. On your handout, here comes the big lesson of the book to which the whole story of Jonah has been working up to. The Lord teaches Jonah a lesson about God compassion. It's an object lesson, but on a grand scale with a plant and a worm and a wind, and in the end, God's big question for Jonah, and see it in the last verse of the book, the big question, highlight it, put asterisks around it, underline it, where the Lord asked Jonah, should not I? The Lord pity Nineveh. It's the Lord's big question about compassion. And really, it's a mandate as, it is a, as much as it is a question that God's people, including all of us, we should all have compassion on the people in our lives. So as you begin your own study of Jonah this second time through, doing it in conversation with members of your DNA group, 
we want you to see the whole book of Jonah through the lens of this question, this mandate, how you are to have compassion on the people in your home, in your church, in your greater community, and beyond. What does it look like for us to have pity on Nineveh, a people who are spiritually and morally speaking, they do not know their right hand from their left? Well, I am so excited to enter into the second study of the book of Jonah. I want to hear your insights. I want your feedback, what the Lord is speaking to you, into your heart, into your life this second time through. What are the things that you haven't seen before, questions you haven't struggled with, but now God is saying to you, this is my message for you. This is how I'm growing and changing you. Faith in Jesus is a faith that will change you. We say around here that if your faith isn't changing you, so you're becoming freer and freer from your sin, and you're becoming more and more like Jesus in your actual personal life, if your faith isn't changing you, then it probably hasn't saved you. This is my message for you. This is how I am growing and changing you. That's what you want to hear from God. How is he growing and changing you? Well, to launch you on your way, let me share three things God has been showing me about himself in the book of Jonah. And you'll be building lists like this in your own study. On your handout, I'm building a list, what the book of Jonah says about God. Building a list. What does the book of Jonah say about God? And here's what I'm seeing. In the book of Jonah, God is totally involved. God is totally involved in our personal affairs. He's not a God who's far off. He's a God who's nearby. He's totally engaged in human history and culture. He's totally engaged in our personal lives. In the book of Jonah, God is speaking to Jonah, and he's speaking to the Ninevites. He brings about his will. He's at work in the world. He sends storms and fish and plants and worms and winds. He's bringing discipline against his wayward prophet. And he brings grace to a wayward nation. God is totally engaged in the lives of the people in the book of Jonah. God is totally engaged in our lives. On your handout, God is entirely intolerant of our personal sin. When Jonah flees for Tarshish, God is not having it. The evil acts of the Ninevites, God is not having it. Jonah's self-pity and his lack of pity for people in need, people Jonah can help, God's not having it. God does not shrug off human sin in the book of Jonah. He confronts it head on. He demands a change in direction. And so God is entirely intolerant of my sin, of your sin. What's that mean for us? Well, most fortunately for us, God is completely invested in our personal well-being. In the book of Jonah, God was invested in his prophet Jonah. And God was invested in the Ninevites. God's will is not for anyone to perish, but for all persons to come to faith and repentance. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. I hope it encourages you to know that God is completely invested in you. Beyond involved, God is invested. You have been a part of the Lord's plans since forever. That's the doctrine of election. He's always had his hands on your life. He made you. He sent Jesus to save you. When you are born again, he fills you with his spirit. 
The Lord sustains your life, and when you die, he wants to receive you into his presence for all eternity in his heaven. You need to know the Lord has no intention of simply writing you off as a bad investment. You are the Lord's Microsoft stock. He's holding on to you. You don't like Microsoft? Pick another stock, any stock. He's holding on to you. So you hold on to him. Let's pray. Let's bow our heads. And let's pray about our second pass through the book of Jonah. Heavenly Father, thank you for the book of Jonah. When we study your word, something happens to us. We meet you in the scriptures. You speak to us. And when we listen, I mean really listen, you start to change us, Lord. I'm asking for that. I'm believing for that for all the people who are investing themselves in this study of Jonah. Lord, please continue to bless your church through this highly unusual season, through all these COVID challenges. Keep us connected. Keep us caring for one another in this church and and caring for those outside of your church. May the people of this church be obedient and generous so we can continue the work of Jesus through this church in your community. Lord, you are completely invested in us, and we want to invest ourselves in and through this community. For your glory and our good, and in Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. Stephen, will you close our time, you and Jeff, in worship? We just stand and sing with us. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge, our judge and our defender, suffered and crucified, forgiveness is in you, descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light, you're ever seated I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. Let's sing together, I believe. And I believe in you, and I believe you rose again, and I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. Sing that again, I believe. I believe. Oh
believe. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can we celebrate God together one last time? Thank God is so good. Thank you for singing with us today. Here on your way up, please gather your things. There's an offering basket on the table by the door. You can place your gifts in there as you head out. Uh, one last thing I really want to put on your radar is next week is daylight savings time. So please pay attention and reset your clocks for that. And we'll see you guys next week. Have a great week. Thank you.